Hello and welcome. This is the extended content from part one of Spying on America by Foreign Made Drones. If you have not seen that first part yet, please go watch that as that was the introductory part and main questions. This further goes into some of the issues that we started to discuss in part one from the original six presenters. And this video starts off right where the conversation left off in the first video. So please watch that one first before jumping into this one. And we hope that you enjoy this extended content. If you have any questions or comments, please post them in the comments section. And of course, please like and subscribe to our channel. Let, let me uh, add one comment onto that discussion uh, while we have a, a moment. Um, yeah. you know, somewhere between what, what Patrick and Thomas were saying, uh, the reality is the Department of Defense, Department of Justice, Department of Interior, and, and in particular then the grants that flow down to uh, state and local law enforcement and government, uh, that really does form one of, if not the largest market for drone technology. Um, so I think when we talk about the requirements that need to be put in place and the, the legislation that needs to happen, it seems to me that, uh, you know, having requirements for uh, there, there not to be predatory pricing or price dumping uh, to ensure that the companies that uh, we are sourcing from uh, are are not foreign controlled foreign influence. Um, you know, it just doesn't need to go down the road of being a protectionist binary. We're talking about uh, providing uh, this technology to the the civil and defense um, space uh, on a on an equitable basis on a level playing field. And if I think the the Congress provided the funding to uh, facilitate that type of competition. Uh, I think it would be the game changer. I think it would be the bridge to broader uh, competitiveness of the U.S. industry. Uh, and I think, boy, if we paired that with FAA uh, reform to the, the national airspace regulations uh, and the approach there, I, I think that that's a really compelling case. So I'd like to see that uh, that be a possibility. Kind of goes into the next question I was going to jump down to is what strategic benefits to business, your business, or, just, or you've seen in the industry, uh, and the, that uh, the drone industry and to our country and its coalition partners in building up the trusted uh, marketplace for manufacturing, fabrication, and any cyber supply chain. But what benefits do you see with that? I mean, I think the the I think it's. The easiest one is not to have to send all of our production designs to foreign competitors are going to clone and come back with with uh, cheaper options. So I think it has become a difficult proposition to be uh, 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 competitive and invest in technology leadership when you understand that the the market that you're going to end up in is is going to undermine your ability to make a return on that investment. So uh, yeah, I mean I think. The, the the business opportunity here uh, is not one that um, you know is uh, some sort of esoteric complicated picture like this is return to fundamentals of build a great product and deliver it to a fair market for a fair price uh, that's the shame of this whole situation is that given how sensitive the technology is the fact that leadership hasn't identified the obvious plans literally, China and, and, and others have published the 2025 plan and said, here, we're going to aggressively target this for us not to have ensured through that process that, that we uh, maintain a, a fair and competitive marketplace is, is the problem here. It's simply returning to where it should be. Right. Bart, what's your vision on that future? Well, I think it comes from several angles, but one of them, the secure supply chain is, I think, is incredibly important. And I think part of that has to do with certification that the products, the components going into these drones are um, reliable, are uh, not, uh, not affected, uh, does not affect our national security. So to do that, I think we have to have an organization within the United States uh, that allows us to be able to uh, to be able to do that to secure them. The other thing, um, there's got to be some regulations with this. Uh, quite frankly, uh, we had 20 states that just had drones donated to law enforcement uh, to be able to do uh, some of the stuff in COVID-19. 
it is really hard to compete with free drones. Um, but if you have regulations in the state that say, you know what, you can't have insecure products working for law enforcement. You can't have them working for state entities. You've got to have components that meet these standards that are verified. Um, then you can then you can begin to you can, can begin to work on that. But this has to come from the state level. On that uh, remark, there uh, a friend of mine with the Kentucky Department of Aviation said that they're actually looking at taking their DJI drones and putting another uh, uh, another flight control system in those uh, for the state, uh, the ones that are being used with GIS and things. So. I'm not sure what the answer is from the states that already have spent a lot of money on these drones that have these sensors and capabilities, but um, it has to come from a funding, a regulation uh, side, at least from my, uh, from my perspective. Yeah, I'd like to add, add on to what you said, especially about uh, DGI's donation. You know, we've see, I've seen, and there's numbers that support, about a doubling year over year of adoption by public agencies to use drones. The vast majority of them are DGI drones. Of course, pretty much 99% are Chinese made. You know, there's like maybe 1% of, you know, American made. But like you said, it's hard to compete with free. And I mean, it's, it's very ingenious on their part if they're, they're giving these away for free because then the other public agencies that may have been sitting on the fence about starting a program, they're like, whoa, DGI is giving, you know, public agencies these drones for free. Of course, the big picture is, oh, look, it's a good thing you're doing, you know, things to support your, the public and the people in this crisis. It's a great, you know, warm, fuzzy feeling thing that everybody sees big picture, but really it's DGI still cornering the market. You know, it's them giving their stuff and getting high visibility that they're doing this. So everybody's going to prefer, let's go to DGI. They're, we've seen that they're willing to give stuff for free. Maybe we can get it for real cheap or, you know, get an advantage partnering with DGI in mm -hmm. the future. But there's, you know, uh, as Dave Chappelle said, there's no free trips to Hawaii. Okay. The thing with this is they are asking people in return to write letters, editorials, endorsements to tell the, uh, the federal administration that this new regulation is going to be detrimental to law enforcement. Now I'm going to roll back to 2008 because we're talking about adoption of drones in police departments. Los Angeles LAPD had an officer who had a drone prior to the, uh, the, the policy clarification. Okay. And also uh, Sacramento was, you know, where I live is where um, one of the first police departments to officially adopt a drone program in 2008. And they had a pro series for anybody remember pro series. Unicorn ProSeries system was very uh, robust, and even when I worked for the Navy, and I go, "Hey, you want to do this? You want to be able to terminate ground targets, moving air targets? There's a company that can do that." No, you're crazy. Not only was it ProSeries, but there was also another company called Dragonfly, and I want to say they might have been at the time from Canada or whatever. But here are two companies, homegrown, that were in the law enforcement arena that withered and died on the vine because of a lack of regulatory um, uh, pathway, okay? So even now we talk about the test centers, the whole U of the United States should be a test center. And maybe you have regional test centers that are administering some of this, but uh, you know, I've done stories on it. We looked at the heat maps. Uh, there are a lot of people in, in our large areas of the country where there really aren't people and there really aren't threats. And you can use the engineering and scientific method to determine the risk and start flying today. Issues with the test centers. And, you know, we, we missed an opportunity with the test centers. Everybody says there's no funding. Well, when the language, the proposed language was written, uh, it was written by an advocacy group, the world's largest advocacy group, and I saw it before it became a, a law, and I said that, I could get these test centers, there's no money. How's anybody going to do anything with any money? Well, that's their problem, you know? So you have that, and then the other issue you have, it's Groundhog Day with the FAA. It's been saying we need data for, I mean, the last 20 years, and the FAA is not collecting the data. You know, in the situation with Precision Hawk and their Beyond Visual Line of Sight waiver, they're a pathfinder. They were out of compliance in their waiver for 18 months. 
So you can't tell me that the FAA, hey, you know, how's it going over there? Oh, all right. Did you collect, oh, how's the data going? Are you collecting any data? Can we see the logbooks? There's none of that. There's none of that for 18 months. Um, you know, to me, the, the, the uh, credibility of the FAA with this I need data stuff, we have Pathfinder and you can get waivers and stuff, totally invalidated. They're, they're sandbagging. And uh, I think that's our biggest problem is the regulatory side of this for those reasons. Right. I, I'd like to jump on the regulatory there. You know, traditionally with Department yeah. of Transportation, we'll look at avi or automobile and we'll look at manned aviation. Traditionally, it was developed by learning from our mistakes. You know, so we enacted a policy or a regulation if something bad happened. The drone industry automatically started off with being tied with his hands behind his back with regulation rather than, okay, let's let them do their thing. Let's see what uh, the marketplace and innovation comes up with. And when there's problems, we'll say, okay, we don't want to do that anymore. That's a bad thing. Let's regulate and let's prevent that or come up with measures that prevent this or that. We didn't do that. We've just been blocked off from the very beginning and slowly, you're right, we're not gathering enough data to quantify what risk factors are to properly regulate so we just arbitrarily came up with regulations with not a lot of data to back it up and we're not collecting enough to even really open that back up to really enable the innovation and utilization in the market well just look at the statistics for manned aviation you know in 2018 there were 393 fatalities at ga now you have to remember that the manned aviation groups like your AOPA and your ALPA were the ones, you know, bring equivalent level of safety. The FAA's got to do something. You got to shut these commercial guys down. We, oh my God, you know, we, uh, and the FAA said, okay, you know, we'll shut them down. And again, that was with no data. So now, you know, we've had a, let's say, legal pathway to commercial drones since 2016. And there's, you know, just the anecdotal evidence that you know we have supposedly millions of registered drones or a million and a half or whatever and however many people flying and there's all these hours and the numbers are all inflated um but you know when you when you look at it we have all of these flight hours um and these operations and no fatalities while ga number of fatalities is going up yeah we've so, got a higher safety record uh, than ga right safety of the nas oh safety of the nas you know and uh safety of the people on the ground well, you know, people are dying in GA accidents and you're just, a lot of these people are out here, you know, horsing around and having fun. And I'm not saying that you can't horse around and have fun, but the argument again, lacks credibility because these aren't apples to apples comparisons. You're dangerous. Okay. Where's the data? Well, we don't have data. We need data. Well, they're obviously dangerous. You want to see the smoldering crater with the fire dangerous, you know, anyway, I don't want to beat that point up, but these arguments, that the FAA has been using for 20 years, they don't hold water anymore. And anyone, you know, it's like Emperor's New Clothes. You go to these drone shows and they get up there and it's hard and we need data and this and that. And, you know, the whole crowd sits there and, and uh, you know, does the nodding dog routine and, and nobody's got the stones to stand up and say, uh, yeah, no, that's not really the case. Here's the reality of it. And I know why you get marginalized. You're not getting any uh, good old boy waivers or any backroom deal or anything else if you're critical of the FAA. But uh, that is not how a first world country works. That's not how a country that's leading the world works. That's how Tony Soprano works. That's how, you know, a mobbed up process works. So you just got to decide what, what, what you want from your industry. And airspace integration is a two-way street. And there has to be accountability uh, from a regulator. And if you can't get it done, get out, you know, get out of the way. Get somebody else in there who's interested. Yeah. Off the soapbox. Hey, I'd like to have some, boy, I tell you, I'd like to have some good news. Um, uh, years ago, I was uh, with the National Guard and got a $9 million grant to connect all the guard bases who have the ability to fly in restricted flight space. And that was going to be a catalyst for, and unfortunately, uh, the JSOC director shut that down in 2013 through legislation that said, only DOD activities could happen in a National Guard base. Well, in 2014, we defeated that legislation. And I gotta understand it. Y'all remember First Robotics, Dean Kamen, and we did the thing at VCU? Well, I'm, First Robotics is all over the world. We are a leader in student robotic competition. 
the U.S. The National Guard has a state partner program, a $30 billion program that I can export and extend what I do in drones and guard bases anywhere in the world. We have the infrastructure in this country to leapfrog foreign competition if we only just pull together the infrastructure and relationships around the drone industry that we already have. But do you think that was leadership in the robotics industry? I mean, I no, it was that. it was intentionally shut down because I believe they did not want the seventy. We led the world. We spent seventy percent of the world's money on drones. And it's not the platform. It's all about the data systems, the network systems, the spectrum. Barb was going to ask me what I would I like to see out of the USA drone port. Well, pull in the NIST, pull in the spectrum, pull in all that advanced technology capabilities that we have today and make it associated with a drone, secure drone range. We could have done this 15, 10 years ago. I, I agree, but I think this uh, industry, I, I'm a total firm believer in the convergent technologies of robotics, uh, land, air, sea, and space. You know, I'm like, I want to lift payload, you know, uh, not really people so much. Um, I think the other issue from our side of the street, you know, I did say it was a two way street, our side of the street, this industry lacks leadership there. I, I haven't seen, uh, well, none. I've seen none. Um, and I think, uh, you know, usually what we do see in leadership is people following the money in the early days of, reg, uh, of the regulatory or integration effort, it was all uh, legacy DOD vendors. And they, sorry, but they were designing the regulations around their existing product, which I thought was a mistake because you're really designing regulation for the past and not the future. Um, you know, that was a problem. And then now we have the Chinese driving the bus on that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even this remote ID thing, and Chris had mentioned some issues with the remote ID, I see the same issues, uh, but there are either more issues, especially if it's a, like a Chinese system that is implemented in the United States, uh, you know, that's a problem. It's going to be hard to compete with that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. As soon as the FA comes up with whatever the hardware standard is, a Chinese company is going to beat any American company to be able to produce something and more cost effectively. Well, it already exists, Chris. It's already built in. All right. you got to do here, take this. Here you go. It, it's fine. We got it covered. It's free. You know, um, it's easy to take the free, just like the police departments. Every police department will tell you we're fire department. They're underfunded. We don't have the money. We'd love to do X, Y, Z, yada, yada, yada. And it's, but there, there is, they're just, I, you know, I've been on the planet for 54 years. There's no free that I've run into. So you have to give something. So, so people have to think about what, the, what, the, what type of capabilities or where they want to be in the future. Anyone ex that excuses the, um, and I see a lot of this people excusing the vulnerabilities, both in manufacturing and data collection and all the rest of that. As far as I'm concerned, their business model is all in with the uh, DJI product. So they have to make excuses. They have to, uh, let's say smooth the edges on the, on the problems that are being highlighted uh, in, in this uh, conference here. Right, and I'd like to add on with the public agencies, sorry, Bart, just real quick. The problem is education also. They're not being educated on what the security factors and privacy risks are with using these drones. You know, so when they're not, it's just like anybody with an app. You download an app and you automatically click, yes, I accept the terms and conditions. That's the same thing with them. That, that's, what we're, that's how our society is. So I think a big thing, because they're free and they're cheap, and that's just where our industry is, is we need to educate the public agencies. If they're going to get these drones, you need to air gap, you need to protect the data, you need to have your local constituency, your, your, your population you support, have checks and balances on you. You know, what data you're saving, how it's handled, so that there's a trust with the public, for one, until we can get a homegrown industry really built up that is secure and, and has public confidence in it. One thing I'd like to say about the, particularly about the free drones, you know, we deal with a lot of people that are on the, that are 
first drones are wanting to do something in a, in a really good nature, first responders, search and rescue, law enforcement, this is not to say anything against them because they're great people doing great work. And, you know, free is wonderful too. But what I want to say for anybody that thinks that the Chinese are not doing this, look at motive. Why would a foreign nation that is in some regards adversarial, why would they for free give drones to another country? There's a reason. It's a honeypot. We have data. We have uh, things that they can gather that they can pull from us. All you have to look, do is look at motive. This is a very simple thing. Uh, if they start building drones in the United States, they're not necessarily American-made drones if the components and the design and everything is Chinese. You it's can build secure. it anywhere, but that make that's not American-made. American-made is when it's secure from the microchip, from a communication standpoint, and the security is completely uh, relevant throughout this. So we have to secure the supply chain. Uh, if DJI puts a plant uh, somewhere in the middle of the United States and says, hey, it's secure, uh, what's the motive? Why would they do that? Just, you know, as just common sense tells us that we need to look at that. I think that's very, very key, Bart, uh, especially when you go back to looking at the culture dynamics of us in America and capitalism. You know, usually when somebody, a company, gives something for free, you know, say, Boeing gave a bunch of drones to, you know, police departments for free. People are like, oh, that's great for them, but it's also, they're, they're capitalistic. So their mindset is, you know, we want to make money off of this long-term by garnering sales from other agencies. The Chinese don't have that mentality. And we don't really, most people here don't really realize what the motive is when a, some, a company from China, China does it. China, if a company does it, it's not necessarily that they're, they're doing it for capitalistic. They want to make money long-term. That's yes, but deeper in the motive is, you know, every every company in China answers to the government. Not like it is here in the US with American companies where, you know, we have laws, we have certain things, there's a separation where obviously, you know, corporations have to do things, but they're separated entities. And if you want certain data or certain things from a company, you have to get warrants, you have to do certain things. Whereas in China, the government can demand you work for the government from any Chinese company. You don't even have to be a government-owned Chinese company. You, if, you're, if you're a Chinese company, you've been signed off of, you can do work for us. And if you do something that we don't like, the Chinese government's going to take your corporate uh, incorporation and say, you can't do business anymore. You're, you're out of work. We'll, we'll, we'll go with a company that is more lenient to our ideals. Uh, yeah, but this is for you, Joel. Um, a goal of DOD's trusted capital marketplace is to provide financing to advance U.S. sources of secure drone components. What would you recommend organizations that produce, sell, or provide any drone service put in place to strengthen their U.S. Uh, drone supply chain? Well, again, I think we need to put in place some kind of a facility that interrogates these COTS components so that if there are inherent vulnerabilities in them, we can assure the private sector that there are no leaks back to another country because there's not a private sector company in the world, any energy company that wants all their data to go back to some global knowledge base. So I think if you add the security into any kind of surveillance or law enforcement capability that you can, uh, UL certification of approval like you do for electronics, right? UL certified. That will then start transitioning the market back to the United States along with the other with the supply chain for healthcare, we just you know again the capitalism goes to where it's most efficient. China took advantage. Everybody, ninety-two percent of our, you know, it's, it's again it's just natural. What I see we have to do is like we're doing a ten billion dollar Jedi program, edge cloud computing. We have more advanced technologies and you know, things we're working on that apply to drones and the operation of drones by the Navy. So I, I look, I'm a piggyback kind of guy. If the Navy and other people are doing things around the world with US technology, with drones, having a civilian aspect of that in a certification program at the USA drone port would then start piggybacking on things that we can do. And maybe we bring in some international partners like the Israelis or the Brits or the Australians and 
leverage, they have some very advanced test range capabilities within the UK that I, I found out the other day that Kinetic UK is definitely sharing their test range capabilities with Australia. Now, why can't we get Kinetic UK to share their test range capabilities with the USA drone port? You're then leapfrogging, you're bringing in our coalition, people who are much more friendly to us, at least they have been in history, and bringing in that capability to look at ways of, of drone test and measurement in areas that we're not even doing today, but they're doing over there. Let me uh, comment on one of the, the finer points of the ecosystem there. Uh, you know, it is very important, obviously, that as we look at solutions to these security issues that we, we sort of do have point solutions. So at the end of the day, having a facility for us to be able to inspect a component, assess it for security vulnerabilities, et cetera, is an important part of, of this conversation. Obviously, that, that's key. What's important about the ecosystem is not just establishing that trusted supply, but the trusted supplier, right? In, in, in a fast moving technology like this, our ability to assess and certify a radio transmission device is great. But as we all know, this is a, this is a, a game of, of cat and mouse. So every single time we develop a new uh, encryption approach or a new meshing technology or and the list goes on from there, anti-jam, low probability detection. I mean, th this is a, a very long uh, cycle, right? Uh, iterated quickly of technology development and if we don't have suppliers who we can trust to continue that innovation, then the whole system is going to come apart, uh, if not today, tomorrow. And, and I think that's one of the things that's really missing. I remember uh, for as long as I've heard about, um, uh, and I'm relatively young, uh, but uh, the, this idea of the, the global sourcing, right? And especially when it's been talked about in the drones, we say, well, why does it matter if the plastic comes from China? And then the argument goes, well, then what about the motor? And the neodymium magnets are really tough to manufacture. The rare earth minerals are tough to manufacture. And big environmental, why not put them in China? And that argument just keeps going higher and higher on, on the bill of materials in, in that supply chain complexity. And, and where you end up is, is a situation where instead of uh, uh, sort of the pride point of designed in America and built in China, at some point you have, you know, designed in China because you haven't built that supplier, that trusted supplier ecosystem. And uh, that's, I think that's a piece that's important to understand about these efforts and these funding uh, lines that can create that ecosystem is to understand it's not just about saying is or is not a particular model of a DJI quadcopter safe or, or is it vulnerable to a certain security risk, but instead to say, do we have the infrastructure in the United States to secure and to produce and build secure technology? And I think yeah. that's a- Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. Going back to the ecosystem, you know, right today we've been clubbing China over the head most of the time, you know, just because they're front and forward of this situation. But really, you know, if we don't have this set up, I mean, the markets, they have and flow. Who's manufacturing what, where? You know, China just right now, it's, it's the cheap source. You know, 20 years from now, it's probably India. They're already starting to downsource a lot of the Chinese stuff down to India because their cost of living in China is going up. You know, their wages are going up year over year. So eventually, China is not going to be the most cost-effective place to manufacture stuff. They might design in China, manufacture it in India. You know, so that, that has complexity, complexity to this chain. Um, but... You know, our, our, the U.S.'s dynamics politically and who we're friends with and not so friendly with is going to change over the years, you know. So this system being set up needs to be able to address those eventualities as well, you know, not just look at, well, this situation went away, so we just don't need to worry about that anymore. You know, this is something that we need to keep, you know, mindful of the entire way. Right. And, and one of the things I'd say for the U.S., we used to set up a thing called the Leading Edge Forum. It was a tools awareness program, a technical information repository, and a really advanced e-learning system that grew out of CSC here at Falls Church, but that supported people around the world. I do believe within the ecosystem that the enterprise aspect of, I used to, when I worked, grew with EchoStorm, we said, you buy a drone for the data. If we actually get leadership in how you handle the data from drones more securely, more quickly, 
everybody, and we work with the network because it's all an eco, it all fits together, the spectrum and everything else. So I'm encouraged that all the TV white space super Wi-Fi equipment manufacturers are all owned by a US company and all that spectrum's in the cloud that can support non line of sight, beyond line of sight for drones. So there are US companies that were the CEOs, which we are talking to right now, get involved. I think they're also very upset that we need to bring supply chains for their own businesses back here. So that it, it becomes having an opportunity to tell them how important it is that drones are part of that supply chain within the ecosystem and then plug you into where some billions of dollars are being spent on you know real-time situational awareness for things uh, overwatch for you know some capabilities for making sure drones don't hit things around the world those kinds of things you know can come together we need a as as tom goldberg said we need a center we need somebody to focus all this or it's just like herding cats yeah yeah and, and the data side or you know the telecommunication side uh, IOT, Internet of Things, is a big buzzword for a lot of them. And drones are just one device that's connecting, that's an IOT thing into that. And we don't want drones to be that weak link in the, in the system that's going to you know, create that problem where it, they could be exploited against us you know, and, and completely disable the entire system. Well, I think at this point, what I'd like to do, we got uh, two or three more questions, but I think what would be probably more relevant now is more or less close to statements because we've had really good interaction with the, uh, with the topics and stuff and um, uh, in regards to this broadcast and what the topic is uh, and what uh, what we've talked about today. Joel. Uh, if you if you will please just close the thoughts well i think that we I, I appreciate being part of this panel i think we made a lot of progress i learned a lot about this panel and how we could contribute to the usa drone port strategically and moving forward and maybe we should all get involved in our own local congressmen to talk about new legislation and mandates and then you know, try to connect the thing that you have to the trusted drone marketplace or capital market and start building those strategic alliances that build a momentum to get to a tipping point. Yeah, thank you, Joe. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes and hopefully some of this stuff will, uh, will grow as it goes. Patrick, what about you, sir? Uh, well, you know, um, it was a good discussion. You, you had some good guests on here today, and uh, a lot of the concerns that I have were, um, you know, aired today by other people, which is good because it's nice not to work in a vacuum. Um, and I think that this is a, a great opportunity to help educate people. You know, a lot of people are asking for smoking guns. You know, they want to see the picture of some guy, and you know, in the strap t-shirt in China somewhere watching drone video, you know, uh, this eye is tearing. Uh, I, I don't know that you're ever going to get that, but you know, let's, um, let's elevate the conversation. Uh, let's not be rubes. Let's uh, talk about some of the realities of what's going on here. It's, you know, I mean, it's, it's the, 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 you know, 21st century and there are some of these realities. You have to realize that you have an issue and, uh, and we have to all get educated. And then everybody here had a, uh, skill set that I think brought a lot to the table. So hopefully, you know, we'll get a lot of people watching this and that will, uh, you know, start asking questions. Yeah, well said. And thanks for being here. John? Uh, yeah, likewise. Thank you, uh, uh, not only for the hosting, and uh, but the, the great discussion that we've had. Um, you know, I think uh, this is a, a topic of, of real concern. Uh, and again, not just for us uh, in our respective you know, businesses or organizations, uh, but as citizens, uh, I think uh, this technology is really, um, we'll call it uh, dangerous in a good way. Uh, it's, it brings a lot of new capability that usually comes with a lot of uncertainty uh, about how it can be used and how it is being used. Uh, you know, again, I, uh, I think that we can see that uh, other people have made clear plans around this and 
uh, some of that is not uh, about sort of the, the cloak and dagger type of, of spying uh, that uh, you might uh, read about in, in the novels. A lot of it is a lot more straightforward. We're talking about a situation where uh, national leadership in, in technology areas like drones in general, but then in specific components of them, really come together to form uh, a threat if we don't have a, a uh, a, a real response to and a plan for how we are going to uh, build on on this technology and and take those security risks head on and uh, so I hope that this conversation continues and I hope that uh, we can all be part of that uh, that solution so. thank you John Chris yeah I mean kind of building what John said and a little bit of what Patrick said I think a lot of people you know we've discussed a lot of the pain points today but you know, a lot of people I don't think really realize that our industry is very new. You know, it's it's in its infancy still. And there's been, a, you know, it's been a slow going thing, but I liken it to where where smartphones were back in 2009. People are seeing that some people, there's been a little bit of adoption. Some people are walking around with, you know, their I, iPhone ones or twos. And, you know, they're, they're seeing the, the utility of these things and viability but we don't have all the apps yet, you know, which was the regulation and some of these trusted things that would really set this marketplace on fire to advance what we're trying to do. You know, so we need to build the marketplace, you know, or the app store, which is the regulation and some of these found foundation of things to really make this take off so people can develop the apps and the different things that they're going to take and use these drones for. And, you know, the regulation side of it, you know, from the FAA has been slow going, that's been painful. And that's one piece of it for that foundational thing. And Patrick said, you know, we need leadership, we need good leadership. And, you know, there's been enough people in this for a while now that there's people that are in this for not the money, but they're in it for the heart of it, because they want to see this industry work and be successful. You know, from 2013 to 2016, you saw a lot of the pop up, you know, fly by night operators and they thought, that they'd, you know, get six figure salaries, you know, and that they're going to make, you know, boat, boat, boatloads of money and skirt under the radar with, with not following regulations. Some of them didn't last very long, you know, but, you know, some of us that have been around a while, you know, we're not in it to make, you know, a million dollars a year off a of lobby and there's not that money in it. But, you know, if we can pull together our leadership to get this foundational marketplace established, I think, 10 years from now, we're, we can be where smartphones are right now. Well, I'll tell you what, I want to thank each of you all. I mean, you brought your expertise. Uh, you answered a lot of questions, and I hope that the, uh, the folks viewing this uh, will get it, will have a good takeaway from it and answer a lot of questions. The title was somewhat provocative, but I think that the explanation that you all have given uh, to this explains why uh, it was titled as it was. I also want to make mention to some of our friends in uh, some of these other countries. I had a gentleman from Spain who is a manufacturer of drones for as uh, different militaries. And he said, why don't you name this, uh, put instead of foreign drones, uh, Chinese. Um, and I told him, I said, well, I said, the Chinese are not the only ones. I said, I bought parts out of other countries that are friendly countries that have been purchased as products built there and when they come in they've really been Chinese parts that are repackaged. So I said it's foreign drones, it's not just Chinese. So um, although they are, you know, from from my perspective and from a lot of people's perspective, when you have 99% of the drones in the mass that are Chinese, um, that says something. Um, so folks with that, I thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all your uh, help and if there's anything we can do from my perspective, USA Droneport, Chris and I, let us know. We're always happy to help too. So thank you all very much. Thank